Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's update on COVID-19 in North Carolina. As of today, North Carolina has 45,102 lab-confirmed cases, 983 new cases reported today, 797 people in the hospital, and sadly, 1,118 people who have died. We continue to pray for those who've lost loved ones and for those who are still hospitalized. Even during a weekend when the actual reporting of cases and hospitalizations slows down a bit, we continue to see record high case counts. And we continue to be concerned with our percentage of positive tests and our hospitalizations. We're watching these numbers closely to monitor for hospital bed as well as ICU bed capacity. Right now, our hospitals do have bed capacity, and that's good. But as Dr. Mandy Cohen will tell you, that can change really quickly. As we see North Carolina's upward trends, we must redouble our work detecting and isolating the virus. Our Department of Health and Human Services team is pushing assistance to local health departments, especially in the counties experiencing the highest growth. Alamance, Duplin, Durham, Forsyth, Guilford, Johnston, Lee, Mecklenburg, and Wake are of particular concern. Over the weekend, I talked with Vice President Pence about North Carolina's concerning numbers. I asked him and the federal government to help us with increasing our testing sites and capabilities, especially focused on these counties. Another focus will be testing all nursing home residents and staff, and this testing is ongoing. I'm now going to ask our Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mandy Cohen, to share an update for us. Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Governor. Slowing the spread of the virus early on has allowed us to build our capabilities to be ready to respond to this surge in COVID-19 cases that we're seeing. That included building up our supplies of protective equipment, strengthening and expanding our hospital capacity, expanding our ability to test people for COVID-19 and staffing up our contact tracing. We are now drawing on these capabilities as we respond to the increase of COVID-19 cases that we're seeing across our state, including ramping up testing in harder hit communities. Um, as the governor mentioned, we are targeting additional testing and tracing resources to nine counties. And again, I'll list them here for you. Mecklenburg, Wake, Durham, Johnston, Alamance, Guilford, Forsyth, Lee, and Duplin. And as we continue to track our trends closely, we know there will be other counties added to that list. It's important that people get tested to help us slow the spread of the virus. Unfortunately, we have heard that some are having trouble getting tests because of conflicting testing criteria. We are reaching out to providers, to urgent care facilities, to pharmacies, to remind them of DHHS's expanded testing criteria and our desire to ramp up testing of those who don't show symptoms. We have appreciated their partnership increasing access to testing, as this is going to be key into our ongoing strategy to help slow the spread of this virus. So as a reminder, those who may have been exposed to COVID-19 but do not have symptoms, especially people from historically marginalized populations who we know are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, should get tested. In addition, people who live or work in high-risk settings like long-term care facilities, correctional facilities, or are in settings where they are at higher risk for exposure, like grocery stores, food processing plants, and childcare, should get tested and anyone who has attended a mass gathering, including a protest, should get tested. If you're not sure if you should get tested, you can visit Check My Symptoms tool on our website. You can also find testing sites near you. There are about 500 now of them posted uh, across the state and are on our website. Go to covid19.ncdhhs.gov. Once you're tested, remember to answer the call from your local health department so that others may, who may have been exposed can get the support and resources they need. You can get a sense of what this process looks like with some new infographics that are online that go over this testing and contact tracing process. And remember, it's important to stay home if you are sick and stay home for 14 days if you had a close contact with someone who had COVID-19. We need to remember that we all have the power to keep this virus level low. 
We can protect our families and our neighbors and slow the spread of the virus if we all do our part and do the three W's. Wear a face covering, wait six feet apart, wash your hands frequently. It's the combination of these actions that protect our families and neighbors. Please continue to take care of yourself and those around you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. As our emergency operations center stays activated for our COVID-19 response, a dedicated team at the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resilience, we call it NCOR, remains focused on another response, recovery from hurricanes. Some North Carolinians in their communities are still recovering from the devastation of Hurricanes Matthew and Florence. These families are dealing with the threat of COVID-19 while at the same time they're trying to rebuild their homes and businesses. Despite the virus, the work of hurricane recovery continues. And today, the state opens a new application process for homeowners seeking federal housing funding for Florence repairs. Much work already has been done. To date, North Carolina has provided more than $3.5 billion in state and federal funding for Hurricane Matthew and Florence recovery. Already, uh, the recovery office has identified and approved more than 1,300 homes for the Community Development Block Grant funding, CDBG. The program starting today took the federal government almost two years, 500 days after Florence made landfall to publish the register laying out the requirements of how this money can be invested. But when it was time, North Carolina was on it and turned in an action plan within 24 hours and was the first state to receive approval of our plan. We know help can never come fast enough if you've been devastated by a disaster, but NCOR's diligent work in acting quickly will mean recovery money getting into the hands of people who need it sooner. I'd now like to recognize Laura Hogshead, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Office of Recovery and Resilience, NCOR, uh, to share a few words about what this application process means for homeowners in North Carolina. Laura? Thank you, Governor Cooper. I know I speak for the entire team at the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency when I say that we're proud to serve under your leadership as we work to help North Carolinians rebuild their communities smarter and stronger. When this office was established in 2018, we had our work cut out for us. Many people in Eastern North Carolina had suffered through not one, but two devastating storms in only two years. And there have been long delays in getting access from the federal government. As the governor said, it took Washington 500 days from Hurricane Florence's landfall to publish the federal register notice needed to gain access to $542 million in community development block grant for disaster recovery funds allocated to North Carolina. However, NCOR did not stand still waiting for Washington. Instead, we engaged in an advanced strategic planning that allowed us to submit the act required action plan to HUD only days after publication of the federal register notice. As a result, North Carolina was the first to have an action plan approved out of the 28 grantees from that allocation of federal funding. This leads me to the most important announcement NCOR has made to date. Today, we proudly open the application period for the Rebuild NC Homeowner Recovery Program, a program that is going to help survivors of both Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Matthew. The Homeowner Recovery Program provides financial assistance to repair, reconstruct or elevate homes that were damaged by either or both storms. The program is available in the counties impacted by Florence and or Matthew, with a focus on low to middle income families that suffered the most damage. Our team has worked closely with HUD during development of the program to increase flexibility and help as many storm survivors as possible while still meeting federal requirements. This is important. People who have already applied through the Rebuild NC Hurricane Matthew program do not need to reapply. Your applications will be re-examined using the new flexibility that the Homeowner Recovery Program affords. Due to the pandemic, our team worked quickly to create an online, mobile-friendly application that lets people apply from wherever they are. That application is now live on our updated website at rebuild.nc.gov. And storm survivors can get assistance with the application process by calling 833-ASK-RBNC. Again, 833-ASK-RBNC. 
or sending an email to info at rebuild.nc.gov. When it is safe to do so, we will open 18 Rebuild NC centers located throughout storm impacted communities where homeowners can meet with our staff. Storm survivors can find updated information on the centers at our website at rebuild.nc.gov. Lastly, while COVID-19 may have required us to adapt the current recovery program, it has not slowed down the delivery of previous CDBGDR funds. NCOR's Hurricane Matthew spending has remained on pace with HUD throughout the pandemic as it has been since September of 2019. Through NCOR's rebuild program, $185.4 million have been committed to Hurricane Matthew recovery, and we have a total of 646 homes that are in the construction process with 359 of those already complete. Homeowners who have damage from Hurricanes Florence or Matthew should visit rebuild.nc.gov to learn more about the program and apply. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Hogshead, and thanks to you and your team for the hard work and the long hours that you put into making sure that money can move as fast as the federal government will let us especially as we have battled COVID-19, it's good to know that we can press ahead on these other critical missions. Uh, we created uh, NCOR, the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resilience, as part of our emergency management operations headed by Mike Sprayberry and Laura, you and Ryan Flynn and your team over there have done a stellar job and have done it safely during this COVID-19. Uh, crisis. I, I commend you for the great job you're doing and bringing homes to people who need them. Also with us today is our Secretary of Public Safety, Eric Hooks, and our Emergency Management Director, Mike Sprayberry. Monica McGee and Brian Tipton are our sign language interpreters, and behind the scenes, Josiah Melendez and Jasmine Mativier are our Spanish language interpreters. We'll now take uh, questions from the media, and if you can Identify yourself and your organization. Uh, we do appreciate it. Thank you. First question. Our first question is from Adam Wagner with the News and Observer. Hi, Governor. This is Adam Wagner from the News and Observer. Um, this question is in regards to the crowds we've seen the past few weeks at Ace Speedway in Glenwood South and other places. It seems like with those crowds and with cases ticking up that there would likely be outbreaks somewhere um, and we haven't really heard of them in relation to either stores or restaurants or events. What steps is DHHS taking to alert the public to outbreaks and do you suspect that, that some are happening and they're just not being reported? Thank you. That kind of behavior in crowds really worries the health experts and the epidemiologists and why we continue to tell people uh, to avoid being in crowds if, if you can, and even if you are, whether it's inside or outside, perform the three W's, wear a cloth face covering, wait six feet apart, and wash your hands frequently. But let me turn it over to Dr. Cohen for a further response. Thank you, Governor. And yes, as you know, that we uh, work very closely with our local health departments to try to understand how the virus is spreading across our state. Of course, we've talked many times on how we track those outbreaks. Um, right now on our website, we do post and track uh, outbreaks in congregate living settings. We track them in child care settings, in schools. Um, but as we've talked about many times is that those outbreaks are not consistently reported. There are only a few that are required by law, the ones that I just mentioned, congregate living settings, child care, and others that are required to report to us. So we often will do the detective work or through our tracing or um, an entity may proactively identify themselves to say, hey, we have a number of cases in this setting, local health department, will you work with us and help us understand what to do next? Um, so those are the settings in which they come to our attention. Those are good. We want folks to get in touch with your local health department. If you are seeing more than two uh, cases, which is an outbreak or five, which is a cluster, we want to make sure that folks are getting in touch with your local health department so that we can help track down and trace any other contacts 
number one, but also to make sure that folks are taking the proper protocols, um, whether that's uh, some additional deep cleaning or a temporary closure or what have you that needs to be done in order to make sure that um, we don't see further viral spread. So we encourage all businesses to make sure that they um, are taking the precautions that we lay out in all of the very detailed guidance that is out there. Those are incredibly important. And if you do see um, the virus spreading in your place of business, please do call the local health department. We can all work together on this. It's going to take all of these actions together, individuals, business actions, are, and our state and local officials working together in order to slow the spread of this virus. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Chandler Morgan with WBTV. Hi, Governor. This is Chandler Morgan from WBTV. My question is regarding the big crowds that we're seeing at restaurants. Uh, we're seeing a lot of crowds where either capacity is too high or people are disregarding social distancing on purpose. Is this kind of behavior adding to the spike in numbers, and is the state considering other guidelines for restaurants to prevent this behavior? Thank you. Well, right now the restaurant guidelines are 50 percent of capacity, and there are other steps that restaurants are taking with cloth face covering and trying to make sure that there is social distancing within the restaurants. We've had some pretty good reports from across the state that most of the restaurants are complying with this. Obviously, they eagerly want uh, an increase in capacity and uh, that hopefully will come down the road as we move into other phases. But we're concerned if there are restaurants that are violating this and we encourage local officials to talk with their all of their businesses to try to make sure that they comply with the law. Uh, Dr. Cohen, would you have anything you would want to add? Thank you. Um, again, related to the restaurant guidance, I'd encourage everyone to go on our website and look at all that guidance. But remember, the Restaurant Association also did partner with us on a program called Count on Me and See. I want to thank the Restaurant Association for that partnership. But I'd encourage even more restaurants to go and take that training, then post on uh, outside so that folks know that you are a Count on Me and See uh, trainee um, and that you're participating in that program. We'd like to see many more restaurants participate in it. I think restaurants we always knew were a higher risk uh, uh, activity. Folks are sitting down, some times indoors for extended periods of time, and we know when you're eating, you are taking off, off your uh, face covering when you're actively eating. Those are, those are risky situations, and we are concerned about them, and we want to make sure that everyone is doing their part, businesses and individuals. Um, I think it is going to take all of our work together. If we want to continue to make progress, and we want to see us be able, as the governor said, to move through additional phases, we need to do those actions together. Um, um, so I, I know that we can. I'm appreciative of the Restaurant Association for participating in that training. I'd like to see many more uh, do that and then see our, um, our patrons go uh, to those restaurants that are participating in the Count on Me uh, NC program. Thank you. Next question, please. Follow-up, Chandler Morgan, WBTV. Thank you for that answer. Specifically, restaurants that convert into bars at night, some of them choose to open later in a different setting, kind of reopening. What would be the guidelines there? There seems to be a lot of issues when it comes to capacity once they change into that setting at night. Thanks for that question. There is no change in guidelines, no matter what time that they are open. They're continued need to maintain that same reduced capacity, need to maintain that same social distancing, and can take all of the precautions that are in our guidelines, no matter the time. Um, and we'd really uh, want everyone to follow those guidelines really intently. Again, this is going to take effort on all of our parts if we're going to be able to live with this virus. And I think you'll, I'll remind you again, our trends are going in the wrong direction, but our state 
fate is not sealed here. We can, we have power over this. We can all take the individual actions together, restaurants included, no matter what time of day, what, what they're serving, um, to make sure that, uh, that folks are uh, doing everything they can to keep virus level uh, low and, and spread down. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Andrea Blanford with ABC 11. Hi, Governor. It's Andrea Blanford with ABC 11. We're now only two weeks away from what we believe will be the end of phase two. Where do you stand today on that potential for a phase 2.5 where bars and gyms and, and the like would be allowed to reopen before June 26th? And should we even assume that bars and gyms and anything else still closed in phase two would be able to reopen in phase three? Thank you. The health experts are looking carefully at the numbers and the science, and we will let the people of North Carolina know at the first of next week whether we will go into the next phase, and if so, what that phase will look like. Uh, we're continuing to monitor these numbers and know that uh, right now they're not trending in, in a good direction, but we still want to give this more time and want to encourage people to continue to perform the three W's and let's, let's press to make sure that we can flatten this curve. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Travis Fain with WRAL. Hi, Travis Fain, WRAL. Uh, we're still early days on research into the effectiveness of masks, but research does indicate that they're most effective when a lot or all people wear them. Some states have required them in businesses, both of employees and of customers. Is that on the table at all for, for, for your administration? Uh, and if so, when would a decision like that be made? Uh, it's absolutely in discussion right now regarding uh, whether we make cloth face coverings mandatory and in what way we do it. Right now, they are mandatory for employees of personal care, like uh, nail and hair salons. Uh, they're required for those employees. But our health experts are looking at those same studies uh, showing the effectiveness of cloth face coverings. We want people voluntarily to do this. Uh, but we are looking at uh, additional rules to uh, potentially make these mandatory. And I'll let Dr. Cohen say a word or two about that, too. Thanks. Uh, and Travis, you're exactly right. There continues to be more and more studies that have come out even in just the last week or 10 days that are now looking at face coverings directly in the, the COVID-19 context. Before we were looking at studies for on how to face coverings look for other viral respiratory illness. Now we have published studies with a lot of different methodologies um, that continue to show us that the importance of wearing a face covering to slow the spread. And you are right, the, the face covering really shows effectiveness when we can get many, many folks doing that all, all together. Um, and it's why we keep harping on the three, three W's and saying that we can do this together. We can have individuals take action here. And we, if we do this collectively, the data shows that we can still flatten this curve. I know we see things going in the wrong direction, but if we act collectively, we can take control of our fate here. I know folks want to move forward with additional openings and want to get back to the activities. I know they want to get their kids back to school. I know I want to get my, my girls back to school uh, this August. This is the way to do it. It's to focus on these collective actions we can do, whether we're an individual or we run a business that is open. It's following those guidelines. It's through doing the three W's. The science is, is becoming pretty powerful um, to say that if we all do this together, we can uh, truly flatten the curve and slow the spread of this virus so that we can continue to make progress. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. Good afternoon, Governor and Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much for taking my question. This is Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. This is regarding homes and rehabilitation facilities that have 
they, they claim to have no positive cases. And I want to be clear, I, I understand that you've got a plan to test everybody, but I have a question about the ones that say that they have no positive cases. Readers have contacted me who are concerned about their loved ones, and they've said that the facilities are not saying whether those facilities are even testing residents and staff. I've asked DHHS on their behalf, who told me to talk to the county health department, and the counties told me to talk to the facilities. The facilities instead meet these questions with how clean their facilities are and what the testing protocols are, but they're not actually answering whether they're testing anybody. As a journalist, I find this puzzling, and just in the interest of full disclosure, my father died last month in Kansas in a facility, and they won't tell me whether they were testing anybody. So I want to know, <clears throat> sorry, does DHHS know whether nursing homes without reported infections are actually testing their staff and residents, and how many of those tests are actually being performed? If not, please tell me why, and do you think this is acceptable if you don't know? Thank you. Kate, so sorry to hear about your dad. I know that it must be a very difficult time for you and your family, and uh, I want to extend my personal deepest sympathies. It's important that we have this information, and it's important that we get people tested in our nursing homes so that we can identify people and make sure that they are isolated so that other people can be protected. But I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cohen to more fully answer your question. Hi, Kate. Uh, first, also, let me extend my sympathies about your dad and share that there's more, I, I think testing is important and I want to make sure I answer your question, but I also want to make sure we know that all of the things that we're doing, testing itself is not the only thing we need to do, which is why we want to have a comprehensive and do have a comprehensive strategy, not just for folks in our long-term care and other congregate living settings, but across the board. And I think it's really important for us to connect the dots between what's going on in restaurants and what's happening in our long-term care settings. We often can't see those dots, right, because the virus is so tiny. But when we have more virus circulating in our community, and it means that the folks who work in those long-term care, whether they do food delivery or they're the nurses or the other personal care attendants, they go out to restaurants too. They go out to, grocery, to the grocery stores, right? And when there's more virus spreading, that means that those folks who work in our long-term care are getting exposed to virus more often in, in their community. And then they bring that virus to those long-term care facilities. And yes, we want to do testing because that is really important because you can often have COVID-19 and not have symptoms, right? That's what's hard. So the person who's doing food service, for example, at one of those nursing homes can feel completely fine. But they went out, as they are allowed to, to a restaurant in their local neighborhood the night, the night before or two weeks before. Right, and then they're going to work, feel completely fine, and could be spreading the virus. So it's more than testing. We had to make sure a couple things. One, are folks wearing the protective equipment, the face coverings that they need when they're doing that work? Are we making sure to do other things, like unfortunately restrict visitors, because we know that's where more virus comes into, into our, those, those settings. Um, but testing is a huge, huge important component of that. So not only are we doing testing when there is, an, is one case, right? So we're not waiting for an outbreak, which is just two cases. We're saying if there is one case that has been reported, we test everyone, staff and residents, and everyone gets tested. The question has been, are we going to do proactive testing when we don't even see virus there? And what we've committed to for nursing homes is to do that proactive testing. Now that's hard, it is, it is not an easy lift to do, so it's not gonna get done overnight, but we've already done this in our state operated nursing facilities and now are doing the work with all of the nursing facilities across the state on how can we marshal the resources, both the time and people and supplies, but also the financial challenges to make all that possible. Um, so testing is important. We want to do it. Um, but I want to make that important connection that it's not testing alone that's going to help here. Um, it's going to, it has to go back to all of those actions. The, the questions that were asked before about the restaurant, they impact what's going on in our long-term care settings as well. Um, so again, it goes back to all of those individual actions built together 
And Kate, I'm so sorry about your dad. I don't want to see any more of that happen in North Carolina, and we have the power to change it. Thanks. Next question, please. Follow up, Kate Martin, Carolina Public Press. Uh, thank you both for answering my question, but I'm really hoping you can um, say if the HHS is aware of the facilities that have no positive tests, if they are actually testing anyone to this point. Thank you. Hi, Kate. So my understanding right now, if they do not have any cases, they are not doing proactive testing. That is changing. We are working to do the proactive testing, even if there are no cases in our skilled nursing facilities. But that has not happened other than in the state facilities that are run um, by, by my, my department. So now we are doing the, the work to work with all of those other nursing homes to do the additional testing proactively. Again, if there is one, one case in the, those facilities, then everyone gets tested. But until they find a case, folks are not doing that proactive testing. We are now starting that work with everyone. Again, now that we've, we've done it for our state facilities, now doing that work um, in our skilled nursing facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, next question, please. Our next question is from Rose Hoban with North Carolina Health News. Hi, Governor. Hi, Secretary Cohen. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions for you. One is, um, are we ever going to see demographic data by county? Uh, I think there are some counties where the demographics of who's getting COVID and who's ending up in the hospital with COVID are very different from other counties. So that would be really of interest to us. And the other question is, I would like you to talk about, are there standardized admission criteria for COVID patients coming into the hospital? I had someone ask me this weekend whether, you know, patients are being counted as COVID patients if say they're coming in for a hip replacement and then they test for COVID and are they counting them as COVID patients? Or are the people who you are counting, are they folks who are coming into the hospital with COVID primarily as their primary diagnosis? I'll let uh, Dr. Cohen address both of those questions, but I will say this, we want demographic data that is as specific as possible. We want it statewide. We also want it by county. I will tell you that we have a very uh, disjointed, independent healthcare system across the state, and trying to get all of this data and focus it in one place is a difficult ex exercise. And there's still some reporting that we want that we're not getting, but I know that. Uh, we are working on trying to make sure that all of that demographic information is reported to us. And we talk about that frequently in our meetings of how many different places are collecting information about testing and how many of those we have to bring in to, to the state. But I'll let Dr. Cohen address that as well. Hi, Rose. So on collecting of demographic information by testing, that is that is much easier for us on the positives. When, when we have a positive test, then our tracers um, and others at local health departments will reach out to that person and then collect the additional data. What we're trying to do is get that on the front end. Uh, the federal government has recently moved to require the collection of demographic information that was hugely helpful to us on the state. And we have now uh, been working on the IT system to make that data a much more automated process that's not done quite yet, but we're working very, very rapidly to make this a much less manual process because right now we just go one by one and make phone calls. Um, and so that's really challenging. We need to be able to collect that information, as the governor said, in a more systematic and automatic way uh, in order to help us drive our decision making about what we need to do next. So stay tuned for more there. And as far as people coming into the hospital um, and whether or not they're found, they're, they're coming in for a specific COVID 
COVID reason or they are then found to be COVID-19 positive, uh, we ask our hospitals to report how many people in your hospital beds currently have COVID-19. Um, so that's how we ask the question. Um, so there may be some folks who uh, came for a different reason. But what I'd remind you about this virus um, is that we are at the beginning of understanding all of the different ways in which a virus could present. We know that this virus causes um, inflammatory disease, particularly we're seeing this new multi-inflammatory disease of children, but we're also seeing inflammatory disease in adults. So when someone, for example, comes in with a heart attack, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction actually can be an inflammatory event. So whether, is that COVID, is that just a heart attack? I don't know if that distinction has any um, clinical difference at this point. I think what we want to do is, is be tracking our utilization of beds, right? Because we want to make sure that what we, are, what we are seeing in our healthcare system, we are not getting over to a point of getting overwhelmed. Um, so we will continue to track that information. I think it is important to know if someone is in the hospital and has COVID-19, not just because understanding their clinical pattern, but also for uh, isolating them, right? And making sure that they are not commingled with other patients who are not COVID-19 and then seeing that, um, that virus spread through uh, a healthcare setting. So it's really important that we do test folks as they come into a healthcare setting so that we can do the infection control prevention that, that is needed when they're in the hospital setting. I hope that, that gets to the heart of that question. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Haley Fixler with WGHT. Hi, my question is about protesters and testing. There's that push to get people who've been protesting tested, but what is the data revealed going into week three of protests? Is tracing finding a spike in protesters being positive for COVID? Are you seeing them as super spreaders? Are there any trends? I think any time that you have a group of people crowded together that are many of them not social distancing, many of them not wearing cloth face coverings, you have the great potential for spread of COVID-19. Dr. Cohen may have uh, information on whether we have traced any particular protests to COVID-19 infections. Usually the contact tracers in that kind of situation will be tracing things down and letting people know, and it's not necessarily anything that would come to our attention, but we want people to get uh, get tested if they've been in any kind of crowd because of their increased uh, chance of getting infected. Dr. Cohen, would you want to add to that? Thank you. Next question, please. Our final question today will be from Eric Sandberg with the Charlotte Business Journal. Uh, Governor, I'm curious, you, you talked particularly early on and you continue to talk about the importance of using science and data in terms of reopening the economy. Given how bad these numbers have been the past couple of weeks, I'm wondering whether you've thought about, uh, you know, pulling back in any way and, and is part of the reason you haven't because people just may not listen at this point because they're so eager to be out? Well, we've got three major initiatives here. We want to make sure that anybody who gets sick with COVID has a hospital bed, an ICU bed, and a ventilator if they need one. Number two, we want to slow the spread of the virus. And number three, we want to cushion the blow to our economy. We have a lot of our businesses that are open and a lot of things that are pushing our economy along. We still have some restrictions that potentially we can ease uh, as we go further. But we're looking at these numbers and we're concerned about them. And at the first of next week, we will be announcing our decision based on science and based on advice from health experts as to if we're going to go into the next phase that would start on Friday of next week and if we are what it will look like. Uh, that's what we're doing right now. We believe that we can get a handle on this. Uh, we're, we're are encouraging people to continue to do the three W's. Uh, we're looking at trying to get more people to use face coverings. Uh, we believe that we can flatten this curve and present, prevent this second surge from happening. 
and we hope that we can do that soon. So I'm asking the people of North Carolina to let's pull together so that we can continue to move forward in easing restrictions. That being said, we will always do what is the best for the health and safety of North Carolinians. Next question. That was our final question, Governor. Okay. Appreciate all of you uh, tuning in, and we're grateful for the hard work you're doing now on fighting the, the spread of COVID-19. We'd ask you to keep it up. Thanks very much.